The Diaries of Adam and Eve by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Shinnevere. Eve's Diary by Mark Twain. Translated from the original manuscript by Mark Twain. Saturday. I am almost a whole day old now. I arrived yesterday. That is, as it seems to me. And it must be so, for if there was a day before yesterday, I was not there when it happened, or I should remember it. It could be, of course, that it did happen, and that I was not noticing. Very well. I will be very watchful now, and if any day before yesterday's happened, I will make a note of it. It will be best to start right and not let the record get confused, for some instinct tells me that these details are going to be important to the historian some day, for I feel like an experiment. I feel exactly like an experiment. It would be impossible for a person to feel more like an experiment than I do, and so I am coming to feel convinced that that is what I am, an experiment, just an experiment and nothing more. Then, if I am an experiment, am I the whole of it? No, I think not. I think the rest of it is part of it. I am the main part of it, but I think the rest of it has its share in the matter. Is my position assured, or do I have to watch it and take care of it? The latter, perhaps. Some instinct tells me that eternal vigilance is the price of supremacy. That is a good phrase, I think, for one so young. Everything looks better today than it did yesterday. In the rush of finishing up yesterday, the mountains were left in a ragged condition, and some of the plains were so cluttered with rubbish and remnants that the aspects were quite distressing. Noble and beautiful works of art should not be subjected to haste. And this majestic new world is indeed a most noble and beautiful work, and certainly marvelously near to being perfect, notwithstanding the shortness of the time. There are too many stars in some places and not enough in others, but that can be remedied presently, no doubt. The moon got loose last night and slid down and fell out of the scheme. A very great loss. It breaks my heart to think of it. There isn't another thing among the ornaments and decorations that is comparable to it for beauty and finish. It should have been fastened better. If we can only get it back again. But, of course, there is no telling where it went to. And besides, whoever gets it will hide it. I know because I would do it myself. I believe I can be honest in all other matters. But I already begin to realize that the core and center of my nature is love of the beautiful, a passion for the beautiful, and that it would not be safe to trust me with a moon that belonged to another person, and that person didn't know I had it. I could give up a moon that I found in the daytime, because I should be afraid someone was looking. But if I found it in the dark... I am sure I should find some kind of an excuse for not saying anything about it. For I do love moons. They are so pretty and so romantic. I wish we had five or six. I would never go to bed. I should never get tired of lying on the moss bank and looking up at them. Stars are good, too. I wish I could get some to put in my hair. But I suppose I never can. You would be surprised to find how far off they are, for they do not look it. When they first showed last night, I tried to knock some down with the pole, but it didn't reach, which astonished me. Then I tried clods till I was all tired out, but I never got one. It was because I am left-handed and cannot throw good. Even when I aimed at the one I wasn't after, I couldn't hit the other one, though I did make some close shots for I saw the black blot of the clod sail right into the midst of the golden clusters forty or fifty times, just barely missing them, and if I could have held out a little longer, maybe I could have got one. 
So I cried a little, which was natural, I suppose, for one of my age. And after I was rested, I got a basket and started for a place on the extreme rim of the circle, where the stars were close to the ground, and I could get them with my hands, which would be better anyway, because I could gather them tenderly then and not break them. But it was farther than I thought, and at last I had to give it up. I was so tired I couldn't drag my feet another step, and besides, they were sore and hurt me very much. I couldn't get back home, it was too far and turning cold, but I found some tigers and nestled in among them, and was most adorably comfortable, and their breath was sweet and pleasant, because they live on strawberries. I had never seen a tiger before, but I knew them in a minute by the stripes. If I could have one of those skins, it would make a lovely gown. Today I am getting better ideas about distances. I was so eager to get hold of every pretty thing that I giddily grabbed for it, sometimes when it was too far off and sometimes when it was but six inches away, but seemed a foot, alas, with thorns between. I learned a lesson. Also, I made an axiom all out of my own head, my very first one. The scratched experiment shuns the thorn. I think it is a very good one for one so young. I followed the other experiment around yesterday afternoon at a distance to see what it might be for, if I could, but I was not able to make it out. I think it is a man. I had never seen a man, but it looked like one, and I feel sure that that is what it is. I realize that I feel more curiosity about it than about any of the other reptiles. If it is a reptile, and I suppose it is, for it has frowsy hair and blue eyes and looks like a reptile, it has no hips. It tapers like a carrot. When it stands, it spreads itself apart like a derrick. So I think it is a reptile, though it may be architecture. I was afraid of it at first, and started to run every time it turned around, for I thought it was going to chase me. But by and by I found it was only trying to get away, so after that I was not timid any more, but tracked it along several hours about twenty yards behind, which made it nervous and unhappy. At last it was a good deal worried and climbed a tree. I waited a good while, then gave it up and went home. Today, the same thing over. I've got it up the tree again. Sunday. It is up there yet. Resting, apparently. But that is a subterfuge. Sunday isn't the day of rest. Saturday is appointed for that. It looks to me like a creature that is more interested in resting than in anything else. It would tire me to rest so much. It tires me just to sit around and watch the tree. I do wonder what it, it is for. I never see it do anything. They returned the moon last night, and I was so happy. I think it is very honest of them. It slid down and fell off again, but I was not distressed. There is no need to worry when one has that kind of neighbors. They will fetch it back. I wish I could do something to show my appreciation. I would like to send them some stars, for we have more than we can use. I mean I, not we, for I can see that the reptile cares nothing for such things. It has low tastes and is not kind. When I went there yesterday evening in the gloaming, it had crept down and was trying to catch the little speckled fishes that play in the pool, and I had to clot it to make it go up the tree again and let them alone. I wonder if that is what it is for. Hasn't it any heart? Hasn't it any compassion for those little creatures? Can it be that it was designed and manufactured for such ungentle work? It has the look of it. One of the clods took it back of the ear, and it used language. It gave me a thrill, for it was the first time I had ever heard speech except my own. 
I did not understand the words, but they seemed expressive. When I found it could talk, I felt a new interest in it, for I love to talk. I talk all day, and in my sleep, too, and I am very interesting. But if I had another to talk to, I could be twice as interesting, and would never stop if desired. If this reptile is a man, it isn't an it, is it? That wouldn't be grammatical, would it? I think it would be he. I think so. In that case, one would parse it thus. Nominative, he. Dative, him. Possessive, hisn. Well, I will consider it a man and call it he until it turns out to be something else. This will be handier than having so many uncertainties. Next week, Sunday. All the week, I tagged around after him and tried to get acquainted. I had to do the talking because he was shy, but I didn't mind it. He seemed pleased to have me around, and I used the sociable we a good deal because it seemed to flatter him to be included. Wednesday. We are getting along very well indeed now, and getting better and better acquainted. He does not try to avoid me any more, which is a good sign, and shows that he likes to have me with him. That pleases me, and I study to be useful to him in every way I can, so as to increase his regard. During the last day or two I have taken all the work of naming things off his hands, and this has been a great relief to him, for he has no gift in that line, and is evidently very grateful. He can't think of a rational name to save him, but I do not let him see that I am aware of his defect. Whenever a new creature comes along, I name it before he has time to expose himself by an awkward silence. In this way, I have saved him many embarrassments. I have no defect like this. The minute I set eyes on an animal, I know what it is. I don't have to reflect a moment. The right name comes out instantly, just as if it were an inspiration, as no doubt it is, for I am sure it wasn't in me half a minute before. I seem to know just by the shape of the creature and the way it acts what animal it is. When the dodo came along, he thought it was a wild cat. I saw it in his eye. But I saved him, and I was careful not to do it in a way that could hurt his pride. I just spoke up in a quiet, natural way of pleasing surprise, and not as if I were dreaming of conveying information, and said, Well, I do declare if there isn't the dodo. I explained, without seeming to be explaining, how I know it for a dodo, and although I thought maybe he was a little piqued that I knew the creature when he didn't, it was quite evident that he admired me. That was very agreeable, and I thought of it more than once with gratification before I slept. How little a thing can make us happy when we feel that we have earned it. Thursday My first sorrow Yesterday he avoided me and seemed to wish I would not talk to him. I could not believe it, and thought there was some mistake, for I loved to be with him and loved to hear him talk, and so how could it be that he could feel unkind toward me when I had not done anything? But at last it seemed true, so I went away and sat lonely in the place where I first saw him in the morning that we were made, and I did not know what he was and was indifferent about him. But now it was a mournful place and every little thing spoke of him, and my heart was very sore. I did not know why very clearly, for it was a new feeling. I had not experienced it before, and it was all a mystery, and I could not make it out. But when night came, I could not bear the lonesomeness, and went to the new shelter which he had built to ask him what I had done that was wrong, and how I could mend it and get back his kindness again. But he put me out in the rain, and it was my first sorrow. Sunday It is pleasant again now, and I am happy. 
But those were heavy days. I do not think of them when I can help it. I tried to get him some of those apples, but I cannot learn to throw straight. I failed, but I think the good intention pleased him. They are forbidden, and he says I shall come to harm. But so I come to harm through pleasing him. Why shall I care for that harm? Monday. This morning I told him my name, hoping it would interest him. But he did not care for it. It is strange. If he should tell me his name, I would care. I think it would be pleasanter in my ears than any other sound. He talks very little. Perhaps it is because he is not bright and is sensitive about it and wishes to conceal it. Oh, it is such a pity that he should feel so, for brightness is nothing. It is in the heart that the values lie. I wish I could make him understand that a loving good heart is riches and riches enough, and that without it intellect is poverty. Although he talks so little, he has quite a considerable vocabulary. This morning he used a surprisingly good word. He evidently recognized himself that it was a good one, for he worked it in twice afterward casually. It was good casual art. Still it showed that he possesses a certain quality of perception. Without a doubt, that seed can be made to grow if cultivated. Where did he get that word? I do not think I have ever used it. No, he took no interest in my name. I tried to hide my disappointment, but I suppose I did not succeed. I went away and sat on the moss bank with my feet in the water. It is where I go when I hunger for companionship, someone to look at, someone to talk to. It is not enough, that lovely white body painted there in the pool, but it is something, and something is better than utter loneliness. It talks when I talk, it is sad when I am sad, it comforts me with its sympathy, it says, Do not be downhearted, you poor friendless girl, I will be your friend. It is a good friend to me, and my only one. It is my sister. That first time she forsook me, ah, I shall never forget that, never, never. My heart was lead in my body. I said, she was all I had, and now she is gone. In my despair, I said, break my heart. I cannot bear my life any more and hid my face in my hands, and there was no solace for me. But when I took them away after a little, there she was again, white and shining and beautiful, and I sprang into her arms. That was perfect happiness. I had known happiness before, but it was not like this, which was ecstasy. I never doubted her afterward. Sometimes she stayed away, maybe an hour, maybe almost the whole day. But I waited and did not doubt. I said, she is busy or she is gone on a journey, but she will come. And it was so. She always did. At night she would not come if it was dark, for she was a timid little thing. But if there was a moon, she would come. I am not afraid of the dark, but she is younger than I am. She was born after I was. Many and many are the visits I have paid her. She is my comfort and my refuge when my life is hard. And it is mainly that. Tuesday. All the morning I was at work improving the estate. And I purposely kept away from him in the hope that he would get lonely and come. But he did not. At noon I stopped for the day and took my recreation by flitting all about with the bees and the butterflies and reveling in the flowers, those beautiful creatures that catch the smile of God out of the sky and preserve it. I gathered them and made them into wreaths and garlands and clothed myself in them while I ate my luncheon, apples of course. Then I sat in the shade and wished and waited. But he did not come. But no matter. Nothing would have come of it, for he does not care for flowers. He called them rubbish, and cannot tell one from another, and thinks it is superior to feel like that. 
He does not care for me. He does not care for flowers. He does not care for the painted sky at eventide. Is there anything he does care for except building shacks to coop himself up in from the good clean rain and thumping the melons and sampling the grapes and fingering the fruit on the trees to see how those properties are coming along? I laid a dry stick on the ground and tried to bore a hole in it with another one in order to carry out a scheme that I had, and soon I got an awful fright. A thin, transparent, bluish film rose out of the hole, and I dropped everything and ran. I thought it was a spirit, and I was so frightened. But I looked back, and it was not coming. So I leaned against a rock and rested and panted, and let my limbs go on trembling until they got steady again. Then I crept warily back, alert, watching and ready to fly, if there was an occasion. And when I was come near, I parted the branches of a rose bush and peeped through, wishing the man was about. I was looking so cunning and pretty. But the sprite was gone. I went there, and there was a pinch of delicate pink dust in the hole. I put my finger in to feel it and said, Ouch! and took it out again. It was a cruel pain. I put my finger in my mouth, and by standing first on one foot and then the other and grunting, I presently eased my misery. Then I was full of interest and began to examine. I was curious to know what the pink dust was. Suddenly the name of it occurred to me, though I had never heard of it before. It was fire. I was as certain of it as a person could be of anything in the world. So without hesitation I named it that. Fire. I had created something that didn't exist before. I had added a new thing to the world's uncountable properties. I realized this and was proud of my achievement and was going to run and find him and tell him about it, thinking to raise myself in his esteem, but I reflected and did not do it. No, he would not care for it. He would ask what it was good for, and what could I answer? For if it was not good for something, but only beautiful, merely beautiful. <sighs> so I sighed and did not go. For it wasn't good for anything. It could not build a shack. It could not improve melons. It could not hurry a fruit crop. It was useless. It was foolishness and a vanity. He would despise it and say cutting words. But to me it was not despicable. I said, Oh, you fire, I love you. You dainty pink creature, for you are beautiful. And that is enough. And was going to gather it to my breast, but refrained. Then I made another maxim out of my head, though it was so nearly like the first one that I was afraid it was only a plagiarism. The burnt experiment shuns the fire. I wrought again, and when I had made a good deal of fire dust, I emptied it into a handful of dry brown grass, intending to carry it home and keep it always and play with it. But the wind struck it, and it sprayed up and spat out at me fiercely, and I dropped it and ran. When I looked back, the blue spirit was towering up and stretching and rolling away like a cloud, and instantly I thought of the name of it, Smoke, though upon my word I had never heard of smoke before. Soon brilliant yellow and red flares shot up through the smoke, and I named them in an instant, Flames. And I was right, too though these were the very first flames that had ever been in the world. They climbed the trees, then flashed splendidly in and out of the vast and increasing volume of tumbling smoke, and I had to clap my hands and laugh and dance in my rapture. It was so new and strange and so wonderful and so beautiful. He came running and stopped and gazed, and said not a word for many minutes. Then he asked what it was. Ah, it was too bad that he should ask such a direct question. 
I had to answer it, of course, and I did. I said it was fire. If it annoyed him that I should know, and he must ask, that was not my fault. I had no desire to annoy him. After a pause, he added, How did it come? Another direct question, and it also had to have a direct answer. I made it. The fire was traveling farther and farther off. He went to the edge of the burned place and stood looking down and said, What are these? Fire coals? He picked up one to examine it, but changed his mind and put it down again. Then he went away. Nothing interests him. But I was interested. There were ashes, gray and soft and delicate and pretty. I knew what they were at once. And the embers. I knew the embers, too. I found my apples and raked them out and was glad, for I am very young and my appetite is active. But I was disappointed. They were all burst open and spoiled. Spoiled, apparently, but it was not so. They were better than raw ones. Fire is beautiful. Some day it will be useful, I think. Friday I saw him again for a moment last Monday at nightfall, but only for a moment. I was hoping he would praise me for trying to improve the estate, for I had meant well and had worked hard. But he was not pleased and turned away and left me. He was also displeased on another account. I tried once more to persuade him to stop going over the falls. That was because the fire had revealed to me a new passion, quite new and distinctly different from love, grief, and those others which I had already discovered. Fear! And it is horrible. I wish I had never discovered it. It gives me dark moments. It spoils my happiness. It makes me shiver and tremble and shudder. But I could not persuade him, for he has not discovered fear yet, and so he could not understand me. Extract from Adam's Diary Perhaps I ought to remember that she is very young, a mere girl, and make allowances. She is all interest, eagerness, vivacity. The world is to her a charm, a wonder, a mystery, a joy. She can't speak for delight when she finds a new flower. She must pet it and caress it and smell it and talk to it and pour out endearing names upon it. And she is color-mad. Brown rocks, yellow sand, gray moss, green foliage, blue sky, the pearl of the dawn, the purple shadows of the mountains, the golden islands floating in crimson seas at sunset, the pallid moon sailing through the shredded cloud rack, the star jewels glittering in the wastes of space. None of them is of any practical value so far as I can see, but because they have color and majesty, that is enough for her, and she loses her mind over them. If she could quiet down and keep still a couple of minutes at a time, it would be a reposeful spectacle. In that case, I should enjoy looking at her. Indeed, I am sure I could, for I am coming to realize that she is a quite remarkably comely creature. Lithe, slender, trim, rounded, shapely, nimble, graceful. And once, when she was standing, marble white and sun-drenched on a boulder, with her young head tilted back and her hand shading her eyes, watching the flight of a bird in the sky, I recognized that she was beautiful. Monday noon. If there is anything on the planet that she is not interested in, it is not in my list. There are animals that I am indifferent to, but it is not so with her. She has no discrimination. She takes to all of them. She thinks they are all treasures. Every new one is welcome. When the mighty Brontosaurus came striding into camp, she regarded it as an acquisition. Huh, I considered it a calamity. That is a good sample of the lack of harmony that prevails in our views of things. 
she wanted to domesticate it i wanted to make it a present of the homestead and move out she believed it could be tamed by kind treatment and would be a good pet <laughs> i said a pet twenty-one feet high and eighty-four feet long would be no proper thing to have about the place because even with the best intentions and without meaning any harm it could sit down on the house and mash it for anyone could see by the look of its eye that it was absent-minded still her heart was set upon having that monster and she couldn't give it up she thought we could start a dairy with it and wanted me to help milk it but i couldn't it was too risky the sex wasn't right and we hadn't any ladder anyway then she wanted to ride it and look at the scenery thirty or forty feet of its tail was lying on the ground like a fallen tree and she thought she could climb it but she was mistaken when she got to the steep place it was too slick and down she came and would have hurt herself but for me was she satisfied now no nothing ever satisfies her but demonstration untested theories are not in her line and she won't have them it is the right spirit i concede it it attracts me i feel the influence of it if i were with her more i think i should take it up myself well she had one theory remaining about this colossus she thought that if we could tame it and make him friendly we could stand in the river and use him for a bridge it turned out that he was already pretty tame enough at least as far as she was concerned so she tried her theory but it failed every time she got him properly placed in the river and went ashore to cross over him he came out and followed her around like a pet mountain like the other animals they all do that eve's diary continued tuesday wednesday thursday and today all without seeing him it is a long time to be alone still it is better to be alone than unwelcome friday i had to have company i was made for it i think so i made friends with the animals they are just charming and they have the kindest disposition and the politest ways they never look sour they never let you feel that you are intruding they smile at you and wag their tail if they've got one and they are always ready for a romp or an excursion or anything you want to propose i think they are perfect gentlemen all these days we have had such good times and it hasn't been lonesome for me ever lonesome no i should say not why there's always a swarm of them around sometimes as much as four or five acres you can't count them and when you stand on a rock in the midst and look out over the furry expanse it is so mottled and splashed and gay with color and frisking sheen and sunflash and so rippled with stripes that you might think it was a lake only you know it isn't and there's storms of sociable birds and hurricanes of whirring wings and when the sun strikes all that feathery commotion you have a blazing up of all the colors you can think of enough to put your eyes out we have made long excursions and i have seen a great deal of the world almost all of it i think and so i am the first traveler and the only one when we are on the march it is an imposing sight there's nothing like it anywhere for comfort i ride a tiger or a leopard because it is soft and has a round back that fits me and because they are such pretty animals but for long distance or for scenery i ride the elephant he hoists me up with his trunk but i can get off myself when we are ready to camp he sits and i slide down the back way the birds and animals are all friendly to each other and there are no disputes about anything they all talk and they all talk to me but it must be a foreign language for i cannot make out a word they say yet they often understand me when i talk back particularly the dog and the elephant it makes me ashamed it shows that they are brighter than i am for i want to be the principal experiment myself and i intend to be too 
I have learned a number of things and am educated now, but I wasn't at first. I was ignorant at first. At first it used to vex me, because, with all my watching, I was never smart enough to be around when the water was running uphill, but now I do not mind it. I have experimented and experimented until now I know it never does run uphill, except in the dark. I know it does in the dark, because the pool never goes dry, which it would, of course, if the water didn't come back in the night. It is best to prove things by actual experiment, then you know, whereas if you depend on guessing and supposing and conjecturing, you never get educated. Some things you can't find out, but you will never know you can't by guessing and supposing. No, you have to be patient and go on experimenting until you find out that you can't find out. And it is delightful to have it that way. It makes the world so interesting. If there wasn't anything to find out, it would be dull. Even trying to find out and not finding out is just as interesting as trying to find out and finding out, and I don't know but more so. The secret of the water was a treasure until I got it. Then the excitement all went away and I recognized a sense of loss. By experiment, I know that wood swims and dry leaves and feathers and plenty of other things. Therefore, by that cumulative evidence, you know that a rock will swim. But you have to put up with simply knowing it, for there isn't any way to prove it up to now. But I shall find a way. Then that excitement will go. Such things make me sad, because by and by, when I have found out everything, there won't be any more excitements. And I do love excitement so. The other night I couldn't sleep for thinking about it. At first I couldn't make out what I was made for. But now I think it was to search out the secrets of this wonderful world and be happy and thank the giver of it all for devising it. I think there are many things to learn yet. I hope so. And by economizing and not hurrying too fast, I think they will last weeks and weeks. I hope so. When you cast up a feather, it sails away on the air and goes out of sight. Then you throw up a clod, and it doesn't. It comes down every time. I have tried it and tried it, and it is always so. I wonder why it is. Of course, it doesn't come down, but why should it seem to? I suppose it is an optical illusion. I mean, one of them is. I don't know which one. It may be the feather, it may be the clod. I can't prove which it is. I can only demonstrate that one or the other is a fake, and let a person take his choice. By watching, I know that the stars are not going to last. I have seen some of the best ones melt and run down the sky. Since one can melt, they can all melt. Since they can all melt, they can all melt the same night. That sorrow will come, I know it. I mean to sit up every night and look at them as long as I can stay awake, and I will impress those sparkling fields on my memory, so that by and by, when they are taken away, I can by my fancy restore those lovely myriads to the black sky and make them sparkle again, and double them by the blurs of my tears. After the Fall When I look back, the garden is a dream to me. It was beautiful, surpassingly beautiful, enchantingly beautiful, and now it is lost, and I shall not see it any more. The garden is lost, but I have found him and am content. He loves me as well as he can. I love him with all the strength of my passionate nature, and this, I think, is proper to my youth and sex. If I ask myself why I love him, I find I do not know and do not really much care to know. So I suppose that this kind of love is not a product of reasoning and statistics, like one's love for other reptiles and animals. I think that this must be so. 
I love certain birds because of their song. But I do not love Adam on account of his singing. No, it is not that. The more he sings, the more I do not get reconciled to it. Yet I ask him to sing, because I wish to learn to like everything he is interested in. I am sure I can learn, because at first I could not stand it, but now I can. It sours the milk, but it doesn't matter. I can get used to that kind of milk. It is not on account of his brightness that I love him. No, it is not that. He is not to blame for his brightness, such as it is, for he did not make it himself. He is as God made him, and that is sufficient. There was a wise purpose in that, that I know. In time it will develop, though I think it will not be sudden, and besides, there is no hurry. He is well enough just as he is. It is not on account of his gracious and considerate ways and his delicacy that I love him. No, he has lacks in this regard, but he is well enough just so and is improving. It is not on account of his industry that I love him. No, it is not that. I think he has it in him, and I do not know why he conceals it from me. It is my only pain. Otherwise, he is frank and open with me now. I am sure he keeps nothing from me but this. It grieves me that he should have a secret from me, and sometimes it spoils my sleep thinking of it. But I will put it out of my mind. It shall not trouble my happiness, which is otherwise full to overflowing. It is not on account of his education that I love him. No, it is not that. He is self-educated and does really know a multitude of things, but they are not so. It is not on account of his chivalry that I love him. No, it is not that. He told on me, but I do not blame him. It is a peculiarity of sex, I think, and he did not make his sex. Of course, I would not have told on him. I would have perished first, but that is a peculiarity of sex, too, and I do not take credit for it. For I did not make my sex. Then why is it that I love him? Merely because he is masculine, I think. At bottom he is good, and I love him for that. But I could love him without it. If he should beat me and abuse me, I should go on loving him. I know it. It is a matter of sex, I think. He is strong and handsome, and I love him for that. And I admire him and am proud of him, but I could love him without those qualities. If he were plain, I should love him. If he were a wreck, I should love him. And I would work for him and slave over him and pray for him and watch by his bedside until I died. Yes, I think I love him merely because he is mine and is masculine. There is no other reason, I suppose. And so I think it is, as I first said, that this kind of love is not a product of reasonings and statistics. It just comes, none knows whence, and cannot explain itself, and doesn't need to. It is what I think, but I am only a girl, the first that has examined this matter, and it may turn out that in my ignorance and inexperience I have not got it right. Forty years later. It is my prayer, it is my longing, that we pass from this life together. A longing which shall never perish from earth, but shall have place in the heart of every wife that loves until the end of time. And it shall be called by my name. But if one of us must go first, it is my prayer that it shall be I. For he is strong, I am weak. I am not so necessary to him as he is to me. Life without him would not be life. How could I endure it? This prayer is also immortal, and will not cease from being offered up while my race continues. I am the first wife, and in the last wife I shall be repeated. At Eve's Grave Adam Wheresoever she was, there was Eden. End of Eve's Diary by Mark Twain
The Diaries of Adam and Eve by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Extracts from Adam's Diary, translated from the original manuscript by Mark Twain. Note I translated a portion of this diary some years ago, and a friend of mine printed a few copies in an incomplete form, but the public never got them. Since then, I have deciphered some more of Adam's hieroglyphics, and think he has now become sufficiently important as a public character to justify this publication. Mark Twain Monday This new creature with the long hair is a good deal in the way. It is always hanging around and following me about. I don't like this. I am not used to company. I wish it would stay with the other animals. Cloudy today, wind in the east, think we shall have rain. Where did I get that word? I remember now. The new creature uses it. Tuesday. Been examining the great waterfall. It is the finest thing on the estate, I think. The new creature calls it Niagara Falls, why I am sure I do not know, says it looks like Niagara Falls. That is not a reason. It is merely waywardness and imbecility. I get no chance to name anything myself. The new creature names everything that comes along before I can get in a protest. And always that same pretext is offered. It looks like the thing. There is the dodo, for instance. Says the moment one looks at it, one sees at a glance that it looks like a dodo. It will have to keep that name, no doubt. It wearies me to fret about it, and it does no good anyway. Dodo. It looks no more like a dodo than I do. Wednesday. Built me a shelter against the rain, but could not have it to myself in peace. The new creature intruded. When I tried to put it out, it shed water out of the holes it looks with, and wiped it away with the back of its paws, and made a noise such as some of the other creatures make when they are in distress. I wish it would not talk. It is always talking. That sounds like a cheap fling at the poor creature, a slur, but I do not mean it so. I have never heard the human voice before and any new and strange sound intruding itself here upon the solemn hush of these dreaming solitudes offends my ear and seems a false note. And this new sound is so close to me. It is right at my shoulder, right at my ear, first on one side and then on the other, and I am used only to sounds that are more or less distant from me. Friday the naming goes recklessly on in spite of anything I can do. I had a very good name for the estate, and it was musical and pretty. Garden of Eden. Privately I continue to call it that, but not any longer publicly. The new creature says it is all woods and rocks and scenery, and therefore has no resemblance to a garden. Says it looks like a park, and does not look like anything but a park. Consequently, without consulting me, it has been new-named Niagara Falls Park. That is sufficiently high-handed, it seems to me, and already there is a sign up. Keep off the grass. Oh, my life is not as happy as it was. Saturday. The new creature eats too much fruit. We are going to run short, most likely. We, again. That is its word, mine, too, now, from hearing it so much. Good deal of fog this morning. I do not go out in the fog myself. The new creature does. It goes out in all weathers and stumps right in with its muddy feet. And talks. It used to be so pleasant and quiet here. Sunday. Pulled through. This day is getting to be more and more trying. It was selected and set apart last November as a day of rest. I already had six of them per week before. This morning found the new creature trying to clod apples out of that forbidden tree. Monday. 
the new creature says its name is eve that is all right i have no objections says it is to call it by when i want it to come i said it was superfluous then the word evidently raised me in its respect and indeed it is a large good word and will bear repetition it says it is not an it it is a she this is probably doubtful yet it is all one to me what she is were nothing to me if she would but go by herself and not talk tuesday she has littered the whole estate with execrable names and offensive signs this way to the whirlpool this way to goat island cave of the winds this way she says the park would make a tidy summer resort if there was any custom for it summer resort another invention of hers just words without any meaning what is a summer resort but it is best not to ask her she has such a rage for explaining friday she has taken to beseeching me to stop going over the falls what harm does it do says it makes her shudder i wonder why i have always done it always liked the plunge and the excitement and the coolness i supposed it was what the falls were for they have no other use that i can see and they must have been made for something she says they were only made for scenery like the rhinoceros and the mastodon i went over the falls in a barrel not satisfactory to her went over in a tub still not satisfactory swam the whirlpool and the rapids in a fig leaf soup it got much damaged hence tedious complaints about my extravagance <sighs> i am too much hampered here what i need is a change of scene saturday i escaped last tuesday night and travelled two days and built me another shelter in a secluded place and obliterated my tracks as well as i could but she hunted me out by means of a beast which she has tamed and calls a wolf and came making that pitiful noise again and shedding that water out of the places she looks with ah uh, i was obliged to return with her but will presently emigrate again when occasion offers she engages herself in many foolish things among others trying to study out why the animals called lions and tigers live on grass and flowers when as she says the sort of teeth they wear would indicate that they were intended to eat each other this is foolish because to do that would be to kill each other and that would introduce what as i understand it is called death and death as i have been told has not yet entered the park which is a pity on some accounts sunday pulled through monday i believe i see what the week is for it is to give time to rest up from the weariness of sunday it seems a good idea she has been climbing that tree again clotted her out of it she said nobody was looking seems to consider that a sufficient justification for chancing any dangerous thing told her that the word justification moved her admiration and envy too i thought it is a good word thursday she told me she was made out of a rib taken from my body this is at least doubtful if not more than that i have not missed any rib she is in much trouble about the buzzard says grass does not agree with it is afraid she can't raise it thinks it was intended to live on decayed flesh the buzzard must get along the best it can with what is provided we cannot overturn the whole scheme to accommodate the buzzard saturday she fell in the pond yesterday when she was looking at herself in it which she is always doing she nearly strangled and said it was most uncomfortable 
this made her sorry for the creatures which live in there which she calls fish for she continues to fasten names onto things that don't need them and don't come when they are called by them which is a matter of no consequence to her as she is such a numbskull anyway so she got a lot of them out and brought them in last night and put them in my bed to keep warm but i have noticed them now and then all day and i can't see that they are any happier here than they were before only quieter when night comes i shall throw them outdoors i will not sleep with them again for i find them clammy and unpleasant to lie among when a person hasn't anything on sunday pulled through tuesday she has taken up with the snake now the other animals are glad for she was always experimenting with them and bothering them and i am glad because the snake talks and this enables me to get a rest friday she says the snake advises her to try the fruit of that tree and says the results will be a great and fine and noble education i told her there would be another result too it would introduce death into the world that was a mistake it had been better to keep the remark to myself it only gave her an idea she could save the sick buzzard and furnish fresh meat to the despondent lions and tigers i advised her to keep away from the tree she said she wouldn't i foresee trouble will emigrate wednesday i have had a variegated time i escaped that night and rode a horse all night as fast as he could go hoping to get clear out of the park and hide in some other country before the trouble should begin but it was not to be about an hour after sunup as i was riding through a flowery plain where thousands of animals were grazing slumbering or playing with each other according to their want all of a sudden they broke into a tempest of frightful noises and in one moment the plain was in a frantic commotion and every beast was destroying its neighbor i knew what it meant eve had eaten that fruit and death was come into the world the tigers ate my horse paying no attention when i ordered them to desist and they would have eaten me if i had stayed which i didn't but went away in much haste i found this place outside the park and was fairly comfortable for a few days but she has found me out found me out and has named the place tonawanda says it looks exactly like that in fact i was not sorry she came for there are but meager pickings here and she brought some of those apples i was obliged to eat them i was so hungry it was against my principles but i find that principles have no real force except when one is well fed she came curtained in boughs and bunches of leaves and when i asked her what she meant by such nonsense and snatched them away and threw them down she tittered and blushed i had never seen a person titter and blush before and to me it seemed unbecoming and idiotic she says i would soon know how it was myself this was correct hungry as i was i laid down the apple half eaten certainly the best one i ever saw considering the lateness of the season and arrayed myself in the discarded boughs and branches and then spoke to her with some severity and ordered her to go and get some more and not make such a spectacle of herself she did it and after this we crept down to where the wild beast battle had been and collected some skins and i made her patch together a couple of suits proper for public occasions they are uncomfortable it is true but stylish and that is the main point about clothes i find she is a good deal of a companion i see i should be lonesome and depressed without her now that i have lost my property another thing she says it is ordered that we work for our living hereafter she will be useful i will superintend ten days later she accuses me of being the cause of our disaster she says with apparent sincerity and truth 
that the serpent assured her that the forbidden fruit was not apples it was chestnuts i said i was innocent then for i had not eaten any chestnuts she said the serpent informed her that chestnut was a figurative term meaning an aged and moldy joke i turned pale at that for i have made many jokes to pass the weary time and some of them could have been of that sort though i had honestly supposed they were new when i made them she asked me if i had made one just at the time of the catastrophe i was obliged to admit that i had made one to myself though not aloud it was this i was thinking about the falls and i said to myself how wonderful it is to see that vast body of water tumble down there then in an instant a bright thought flashed into my head and i let it fly saying it would be a deal more wonderful to see it tumble up there and i was just about to kill myself with laughing at it when all nature broke loose in war and death and i had to flee for my life there she said with triumph that is just it the serpent mentioned that very jest and called it the first chestnut and said it was coeval with the creation alas i am indeed to blame would that i were not witty oh would that i had never had that radiant thought next year we have named it cain she caught it while i was up country trapping on the north shore of the erie caught it in the timber a couple of miles from our dugout or it might have been four she isn't certain which it resembles us in some ways and may be a relation that is what she thinks but this is an error in my judgment the difference in size warrants the conclusion that it is a different and new form of animal a fish perhaps though when i put it in the water to see it sank and she plunged in and snatched it out before there was an opportunity for the experiment to determine the matter i still think it is a fish but she is indifferent about what it is and will not let me have it to try i do not understand this the coming of the creature seems to have changed her whole nature and made her unreasonable about experiments she thinks more of it than she does of any of the other animals but is not able to explain why her mind is disordered everything shows it sometimes she carries the fish in her arms half the night when it complains and wants to get to the water at such times the water comes out of the places in her face that she looks out of and she pats the fish on the back and makes soft sounds with her mouth to soothe it and betrays sorrow and solicitude in a hundred ways i have never seen her do like this with any other fish and it troubles me greatly she used to carry the young tigers around so and play with them before we lost our property but it was only play she never took on about them like this when their dinner disagreed with them sunday she doesn't work sundays but lies around all tired out and likes to have the fish wallow over her and she makes fool noises to amuse it and pretends to chew its paws and that makes it laugh i have not seen a fish before that could laugh this makes me doubt i have come to like sunday myself superintending all the week tires a body out there ought to be more sundays in the old days they were tough but now they come handy wednesday it isn't a fish i cannot quite make out what it is it makes curious devilish noises when not satisfied and says goo goo when it is it is not one of us for it doesn't walk it is not a bird for it doesn't fly it is not a frog for it doesn't hop it is not a snake for it doesn't crawl i feel sure it is not a fish though i cannot get a chance to find out whether it can swim or not it merely lies around and mostly on its back with its feet up i have not seen any other animal do that before i said i believed it was an enigma but she only admired the word without understanding it in my judgment it is either an enigma or some kind of a bug 
If it dies, I will take it apart and see what its arrangements are. I never had a thing perplex me so. Three months later. The perplexity augments instead of diminishing. I sleep but little. It has ceased from lying around and goes about on its four legs now. Yet it differs from the other four-legged animals in that its front legs are unusually short. Consequently, this causes the main part of its person to stick up uncomfortably high in the air, and this is not attractive. It is built much as we are, but its method of traveling shows that it is not of our breed. The short front legs and long hind ones indicate that it is of the kangaroo family, but it is a marked variation of the species, since the true kangaroo hops, whereas this one never does. Still, it is a curious and interesting variety, and has not been catalogued before. As I discovered it, I have felt justified in securing the credit of the discovery by attaching my name to it, and hence have called it Kangarunum Adamensis. It must have been a young one when it came, for it has grown exceedingly since. It must be five times as big now as it was then, and when discontented is able to make from twenty-two to thirty-eight times the noise it made at first. Coercion does not modify this, but has the contrary effect. For this reason I discontinued the system. She reconciles it by persuasion, and by giving it things which she had previously told it she wouldn't give it. As already observed, I was not at home when it first came, and she told me she found it in the woods. It seems odd that it should be the only one, Yet it must be so, for I have worn myself out these many weeks trying to find another one to add to my collection, and for this one to play with, for surely then it would be quieter and we could tame it more easily. But I find none, nor any vestige of any, and, strangest of all, no tracks. It has to live on the ground. It cannot help itself. Therefore, how does it go about without leaving a track? I have set a dozen traps, but they do no good. I catch all small animals except that one, animals that merely go into the trap out of curiosity, I think, to see what the milk is there for. They never drink it. Three months later. The kangaroo still continues to grow, which is very strange and perplexing. I never knew one to be so long getting its growth. It has fur on its head now, not like kangaroo fur, but exactly like our hair, except that it is much finer and softer, and instead of being black is red. I am like to lose my mind over the capricious and harassing developments of this unclassifiable zoological freak. If I could catch another one, but that is hopeless. It is a new variety and the only sample. This is plain. But I caught a true kangaroo and brought it in, thinking that this one, being lonesome, would rather have that for company than have no kin at all, or any animal it could feel a nearness to or get sympathy with, in its forlorn condition here among strangers who do not know its ways or habits, or what to do to make it feel that it is among friends. But it was a mistake. It went into such fits at the sight of the kangaroo that I was convinced it had never seen one before. I pity the poor, noisy little animal, but there is nothing I can do to make it happy. If I could tame it, but that is out of the question. The more I try, the worse I seem to make it. It grieves me to the heart to see it in its little storms of sorrow and passion. I wanted to let it go, but she wouldn't hear of it. That seemed cruel and not like her, and yet she may be right. It might be lonelier than ever, for since I cannot find another one, how could it? Five months later. It is not a kangaroo. No, for it supports itself by holding to her finger, and thus goes a few steps on its hind legs and then falls down. 
It is probably some kind of a bear, and yet it has no tail, as yet, and no fur, except on its head. It still keeps on growing. That is a curious circumstance, for bears get their growth earlier than this. Bears are dangerous, since our catastrophe, and I shall not be satisfied to have this one prowling about the place much longer without a muzzle on. I have offered to get her a kangaroo if she would let this one go, but it did no good. She is determined to run us into all sorts of foolish risks, I think. She was not like this before she lost her mind. A Fortnight Later I examined its mouth. There is no danger yet. It has only one tooth. It has no tail yet. It makes more noise now than it ever did before, and mainly at night. I have moved out. But I shall go over mornings to breakfast and to see if it has more teeth. If it gets a mouthful of teeth, it will be time for it to go, tail or no tail. For a bear does not need a tail in order to be dangerous. Four months later. I have been off hunting and fishing a month up in the region that she calls Buffalo. I don't know why, except it is because there are not any buffaloes there. Meanwhile, the bear has learned to paddle around all by itself on its hind legs and says Papa and Mama. It is certainly a new species. This resemblance to words may be purely accidental, of course, and may have no purpose or meaning. But even in that case, it is still extraordinary and is a thing which no other bear can do. This imitation of speech, taken together with general absence of fur and entire absence of tail, sufficiently indicates that this is a new kind of bear. The further study of it will be exceedingly interesting. Meanwhile, I will go off on a far expedition among the forests of the north and make an exhaustive search. There must certainly be another one somewhere and this one will be less dangerous when it has company of its own species. I will go straight away, but I will muzzle this one first. Three months later. It has been a weary, weary hunt, yet I have had no success. In the meantime, without stirring from the home estate, she has caught another one. I never saw such luck. I might have hunted these woods a hundred years. I never should have run across that thing. Next day. I have been comparing this new one with the old one, and it is perfectly plain that they are the same breed. I was going to stuff one of them for my collection, but she is prejudiced against it for some reason or other, so I have relinquished the idea, though I think it is a mistake. It would be an irreparable loss to science if they should get away. The old one is tamer than it was, and can laugh and talk like the parrot, having learned this no doubt from being with the parrot so much, and having the imitative faculty in a highly developed degree. I shall be astonished if it turns out to be a new kind of parrot. And yet I ought not to be astonished, for it has already been everything else it could think of, since those first days when it was a fish. The new one is as ugly now as the old one was at first, has the same sulfur and raw meat complexion, and the same singular head without any fur on it. She calls it Abel. Ten years later. They are boys. We found it out long ago. It was their coming in that small, immature shape that puzzled us. We were not used to it. There are some girls now. Abel is a good boy, but if Cain had stayed a bear, it would have improved him. After all these years, I see that I was mistaken about Eve in the beginning. It is better to live outside the garden with her than inside it without her. At first I thought she talked too much. But now I should be sorry to have that voice fall silent and pass out of my life. Blessed be the chestnut that brought us near together and taught me to know the goodness of her heart and the sweetness of her spirit. 
End of Extracts from Adam's Diary End of The Diaries of Adam and Eve by Mark Twain These diaries read by Phil Chenevere in September 2018